Well, Richard has posted our signal to go. So uh, why don't we do that? Uh, what? Uh, we've got a lot to discuss as usual. And so let's get on to it. For our top news, uh, research suggests that the 1.5 climate target that we've heard a lot about is gonna be out of reach unless we have greener COVID-19 recovery plans. Um, in our technology story, the new Windows for Computers, that's 10X, aims for much simpler things. It aims for simplicity. That's interesting. Now in materials, and I don't fully understand it, but apparently future homes might be made of living fungus. In the, in the space and flight, um, a physicist, physicist is now proposing that we can have human populated mega satellites that can be orbiting our small dwarf planet, Ceres. Um, and in an environment, engineers have built machines to scrub carbon, di carbon dioxide from the air. Will they do it enough and soon enough to halt climate change? And the question around biology, could lab grown plant tissue, for example, lab grown wood, ease the environmental toll of logging and agriculture? And for us, why your most important relationship is with your inner voice. And on medical stuff, ORCAM here will amplify, beam other voices. The ones you're listening to, right to your hearing aids. So that's what we'll talk about today. And now Richard, what's about this top story that our climate change will be out of reach without greener COVID-19 recovery plans? Well, you know, I like to have optimistic stories and positive views. And uh, this is not entirely a positive view, I would say. Uh, and the most careful study that has been done to date, uh, they ended up looking at our environment and looking at the kind of carbon budget that we could have in the air and still prevent the worst from happening. And so they kind of establish a total carbon budget. And then the question is, uh, how long will it take to get there? And their uh, top line conclusion is that even with the commitments around the world for being carbon neutral by 2050, that that is uh, not going to make it and we need to do more. And uh, they say this is a reminder of how quickly we are running out of time. And so, uh, we, if human activities remain as they are, we uh, use up the rest of our carbon budget in the next 10 years, uh, which isn't very good. <laughs> if we are uh, able to, however, uh, repeat the pattern uh, for the next 10 years this year or last year with COVID, uh, CO2 emissions dropped by 7% around the world. And if we're able to keep up or beat that drop, then it gives us uh, a few more years. And in fact, then gives us a better than even chance of limiting global warming to the one and a half degree C 
Paris uh, guidelines. Uh, and they say, you know, we're actually working towards that now because of the pandemic, but the pandemic is going to get over. And unless serious additional activity is planned around the world, then uh, we only have uh, 20, maybe 30 years before we use up the carbon budget and the heating becomes, uh, I was going to say irreversible, but it's not irreversible. Uh, you know, when we've had these uh, disasters before that, on average, the Earth recovered by 20 million years. So, <laughs> so the Earth will recover. Uh, yeah. And we'll find out about us. And anyway, so that's the leadoff story. And it's not good news. The good news, though, is that they're saying the message loud and clear. Now all we have to do around the world is take this really seriously and take it seriously now. Some things are happening within the next decade. We will eliminate uh, internal combustion engine cars. And the biggest part of the drop uh, in the <laughs> last year because of COVID was in emissions from automobiles. And so we're doing some of the right things. We just have to do them fast enough. Any comments? <clears throat> yes, I have a comment. I want to show you a picture from the Grand Canal in Venice. Uh, it's taken in January. And I'll show you the same one taken three months later. I don't know if you can see the difference. Oh, wow. Yes. Show the, yes. Show the first one again, Johan. Yes. Show there the is. first one again. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I've seen that other places in the world and that sort of illustrates just in three months yeah. by yeah. reducing the, uh, the emission. Wow. The, the one, uh, yeah, go ahead. The one fallacy in that uh, discussion though is that even though all those reductions came with the COVID downturn, that was a result of 90% reduction in international air travel and 90% reduction in personal driving around. And uh, to repeat those kind of reductions several fold would be impossible. Right. That's why I was here. And I was just pointing out uh, the significant drop was in automobile transportation, air transportation as well. And we're on a glide path to that because of the replacement of the internal combustion engines, which is happening faster than anybody realizes. Well, and that's uh, <clears throat> the new, new vehicles may be electrically powered, but the, the average age of the vehicle fleet is about eight or 10 years. And mm -hmm. so even though, even if you got to 50% of all the new vehicles being electric, there's still a huge population of existing yeah. internal combustion sure. engine yeah. vehicles that will continue. You know, so the, it, <clears throat> go ahead, Andrew. I, I just think too that uh, Al Gore was saying all of this 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we were on the tipping point then and we only had 10 years to correct the problem or we were all gonna die. And now we're 25 years on from that. And uh, the problem is similar to what it was then. Except more severe. Well. Shorter time span. And nobody's talking about population issues. And really those are the ones that's uh, killing the planet, not uh, fossil fuels. That's yeah. right. You and Clive yeah. want to kill all the people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, finally don't really, want... I'm finally really pleased to uh, find somebody who's on the same page as me 
in that if you can reduce the population, you solve all the problems. <laughs> but how uh, do we do that? <laughs> uh, I, I think Mother Nature will take care of that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been we, need, yeah. we need more uh, <laughs> bad mutations of the virus. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I heard but, uh, I read somewhere that one and a half billion tons of ice melted in the Arctic last year. One and, one and a half billion tons. That's a lot of melt. That's a lot of ice. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I'm I'm optimistic about the planet. I'm not that optimistic about Homo sapiens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could die, and the planet would probably survive. <laughs> Richard, I don't quite see the connection between greener COVID nineteen recovery plans and uh, climate uh, temperature reduction. I don't. Could you? Could uh, you there could are you people. Clarify that? There are certainly people around the world who are saying that we have to have uh, recovery plans in countries like the US from the, the okay. virus that include uh, within them plans that uh, deal with the environment. An example of that are things like the Green New Deal, where we uh, beef up our economy by giving people jobs, doing things to uh, support the environment. I believe that's what they're talking about. If we, if we, if we move on to technology, what's this new Windows? <laughs> <clears throat> but aims for simplicity. Well, here, I, Windows is such a uh, big thing in the life of uh, most people's computer use that I thought I would include this uh, kind of product information for the release of the new Windows 10 X. I don't know if that's going to be its final name. This is pre-release information. Uh, and so anyway, the new Windows will <clears throat> not be for mostly for me or you. It's going to be something that comes installed in uh, new laptops and Windows is really designing it to uh, as an operating system for low end devices that'll compete with Google's Chromebook. And uh, uh, Chromebook is an internet connected computer and uh, uses the web for many things and not the on the computer and so Windows has designed a very simplified version of Windows for that environment and it eliminates a lot of commonly used functions that you're used to and simplifies other functions and it works automatically with you have to set up a Microsoft OneDrive account and it stores everything uh, on the web and it doesn't let let you store it on your local machine even. So it's a big difference. And uh, then it looks like it's not going to run legacy apps. They say maybe in a while they'll have support the desktop apps. And you won't be able to go buy a copy of it. You buy a new computer and it's on there it'll be released uh early next year and or this spring this this year and you'll start to hear about it and i wanted you to hear about it here so uh you uh don't get too excited or if you want your windows version of a chromebook you can get very excited it's almost here any comments? Yeah. Well, my wife and I both have a Chromebook. I made that decision like two or three years ago, and it's the way to go. It makes it just makes life so simple. 
you just it it just works for you. You're not having to think about updates and backups and viruses and all this. You just get on your computer and do what you like with it. Mm-hmm. So I really I really believe in the concept. Okay, uh, thank you. That was a word from our sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? The trouble I have with it is uh, it says it won't run legacy applications, and I use a lot of those. Well, so I, I don't. I have yeah. the first thing for me with a computer is it has to be able to do what I do with it, and if it won't, yeah. then it doesn't work. Yeah. Also, it, and I suppose it, that's. It, I suppose that's the issue. Some people don't need nearly as many as are on there, and other people do. The other issue is that you have to have a good internet connection, because if you use everything off from the internet and uh, Telmax isn't working today, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought of that one before I got my Chromebook, and if if you have a deal with next door that if your internet is down, you can use their internet. <laughs> that's not a problem. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, certainly are friends. <laughs> Maybe with your cell phone, you can turn your cell phone into a Wi-Fi hotspot and run your computer from your cell phone. Yeah, yeah. This I've not found. It's um, it, it, sometimes there's extra steps. If somebody sends you an attachment on an email, you have to download that mm-hmm. before you can open it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and so there is a small amount of storage for things like that. You know, things that you download off an email and things like that. But and you have to keep cleaning that up because. Mm-hmm. Uh, Otherwise, you know, it's you, you, you'd get overwhelmed. But sure. uh, I, I, it really works for me. I love it. Uh-huh. And it certainly, it sounds like uh, it can be uh, a great solution and a, a great solution for pretty much the typical computer user. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want like... Um, so, so you know, email, web browsing, uh, compose documents, uh, use spreadsheets, all that is dead easy, you know. For me, uh, one of the things that I've been doing a lot since uh, the COVID and Zoom days, though, is I've been <laughs> doing a lot of video recording and video editing. And when you're doing that, you have uh, big files and uh, you can't open them up over the internet so readily. And to do that kind of editing, I I feel like I need to have the file on my computer, even when I work on it, Mm -hmm. then to go and take that video file and after I'm finished with editing it and save it, then it has to recompile all the video and it can take an hour to do that. And uh, that would be terrible over the web, I bet. Anyway, it depends on how you're using it. And I think you're saying here, if you're using email, uh, writing and doing spreadsheets and stuff like that, I'm sure it's a great application. It's a great use. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have to worry about backing anything up. I mean, as you're composing a document, it's already, you know, it's updating on the cloud. If uh-huh. your computer goes down, it's all there. Right. The, you know, within the same sentence, usually. <laughs> Okay, well, Moving thank you for your user Fred. experience, and I'll get out of your way, Fred. All right. <laughs> now, what is this about future homes could be made of fungus, living fungus? What's that? Well, it's uh, interesting. Uh, do you know that right now, 
uh, uh, about we were talking to begin with of the trouble we're in with uh, CO2 in the environment and almost 40% of that, 40% of that comes from uh, buildings and building constructions. About half of that that comes from building construction comes from making steel and making concrete. And uh, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, in the summer of 2014, uh, most of you probably didn't notice, but in New York City, outside uh, the MoMA Art Museum, they started building a building that looked like an igloo, but it just kept going up and up into towers. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that it was made out of 10,000 bricks that had been make, made by packing agricultural waste and mycelium, the fungus that makes mushroom, into a mold and letting them grow into a solid mass. And then they made bricks and they made the building from the bricks. And so, since then, this has gotten uh, people interested, and there's one place, particularly the Information for Technology and Architecture in Copenhagen, Denmark, is taking that idea and running with it. And they have created a Fungar, F-U-N-G-A-R project to see what kinds of new buildings and building materials that they can make out of mushrooms. And uh, they have uh, been able to uh, make real success uh, in going beyond the fungus bricks. For example, one of the things they're doing is they can make uh, things that are like hardboard, particle board that are used uh, for wall panels by uh, growing fungus mixed with uh, straw. And then they, uh, in this process, heat the straw to kill the fungus because you don't want the fungus to keep growing because otherwise it'll digest mm. all the straw and the good building strength that you get from the straw would vanish into the fungal stomachs, I guess. And so anyway, they're making it, they're able to make things like hardwood and what they're finding out is that using a uh, different kind of fungus and different kind of agricultural waste, uh, they can change the growth conditions and they can make different kinds of building material with different mechanical properties. This is still relatively in its infancy. Uh, the next thing they're going to do that's real public is uh, this year they're going to make a, a small freestanding building uh, out of fungus, I guess it'll be fungus bricks and fungus panels as a demonstration of what you can do. And uh, maybe there are alternatives to these materials that are polluting. Oh, by the way, the uh, fungus bricks, when you're through with them, they're entirely recyclable. And they were talking about uh, baking buildings out of living fungus. It turns out if you have the fungus and you keep it alive, the fungus is a living organism and it transmits information among itself and they're trying to figure out how to use the fungus transmitting of information as kind of built-in wiring so your building can tell if it's too hot and then needs to open windows for example. Any thoughts? Where, where is this company located? 
uh, the research is being done in a university in Copenhagen. Oh, wow. Impressive. I would also think that and you didn't mention about a wood, but uh, it could probably save, maybe save the forest if eventually you know, we wouldn't need as many trees for when we build houses. There's another story. I'll have it a little bit about wood. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we'll talk about that. Also, I first heard about this fungal building material a few months ago and as a part of somebody's plan about how to uh, build structures on the moon as we're occupying the moon, because it turns out uh, you can ship fungal spores to the moon pretty easily, a lot easier than it is to ship bricks. The other advantage of this is that uh, it has good uh, sound insulation. Yes. So if you use it for apartments, that's a big, big advantage. Yes, yes, yeah. you're exactly right. Well, you are, I think the real, realtor should have a, a checkpoint, checklist item that you're not allergic to fungus. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yeah, because some people are allergic to mushrooms. Okay. Ah, ah, yeah. That would be terrible if you were allergic to your new house. <laughs> yeah, we just said you you use have to use something to uh, to stop the growth, which means you kill the fungus. Right, they do that. So, it takes them about two weeks to grow the brick, and then after two weeks, they heat treat it to kill the fungus. And do they know the durability? Like, does it last for years or decades or? Since the first brick was made a few years ago, uh, they haven't been able to life test it beyond a few years. OK, thank you. I don't know yeah. if we'll be able to build uh, aqueducts that, like the Romans did that uh, are there thousands of years later out of fungal bricks. Maybe. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm just wondering what would happen if uh, you have a house made out of fungal uh, material and uh, it starts to rain or, or some <laughs> other organism gets being introduced. <laughs> well, I, mean, you I might find yourself. I hope they heard that. It, I hope they heard about rain, the guys that are doing this. It rain in Copenhagen? Yeah, I'm very much so. Okay. All the time. Okay, then they <laughs> heard about rain. It would be worse if they were making it in the desert. Yeah. yeah. So we move on from our future homes of fungus into flight. And apparently, that we might have a bunch of us living on a satellite orbiting a dwarf planet series. What's that about? Well, uh, it's interesting. As I say here, uh, I've been reading about stuff like that for uh, 60 years in the science fiction that I'm reading. And this is uh, a physicist, Pekka, John Hunken with the Finnish Meteorological Institute has uh, written a paper suggesting that uh, instead, you know, Mars and the moon, there are a lot of difficulties uh, building habitation on both places. The climate isn't positive for humans and there are a lot of other problems. And he said it would be easier if we want to live off the planet to populate a giant satellite that orbits Ceres. And Ceres, for those of you who don't know about it, is a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. And it's not big enough to be a planet. Otherwise, it would be one of our 10 planets. But we don't have that many because we think it's a reject as a planet. 
And so the uh, part of the problem that when you build in space is protecting people from radiation also and providing gravity because it's nice if to have gravity. And especially when you're exercising and walking. And so this guy thinks Ceres is the perfect place to make a satellite. And what he would do is he would place it in orbit around Ceres, a geosynchronous orbit that is 636 miles above Ceres. And then he wants to put a... Uh, 636 mile long space elevator to carry things from the surface of Ceres up to his satellite, you know, because you need materials if you're going to make a satellite and he's going to make a mile long satellite. It's kind of like a clamshell and uh, with solar panels on both sides and with a clam shell, it can rotate to provide gravity. And he says he would start off uh, small just with say 500 people and uh, get us off the planet. And he thinks that's a lot better solution than trying to live on Mars or the moon. <laughs> Any comments? Somebody's speaker is on in. I think the pre-qualification to live on this planet is, is somebody who stayed indoors 100% of the time during COVID for two years. <laughs> no, it, it seems that, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <clears throat> it seems that it's a risky place being in amongst the asteroids. Mm. <laughs> you know, they can keep people alive the same as they do on the uh, International Space Station, but you can't offer people a life. I mean, people need a natural environment and things like that to have a life, you know, kind of. Well, you can build your gardens in your spaceship. Yes. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about weeds so much. <laughs> I don't know if you looked at the comments on this particular article, but no, there were a lot of interesting comments and people poo-hooing the idea for various reasons. Well, there are a lot of people who think small. I like guys, uh, to me, it's a grand idea and it's uh, at least possible. What I still don't know about, what I wonder about personally are the space elevators because I've been reading about them for a long time. Uh, one of the things I wonder is how in the heck do you make a 636 mile long elevator cable that isn't heavy enough to pull your satellite down? Oh, I, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke but there was a science fiction book written about it. Right, and more than one. They made um, they made a fiber that was like it was like a, a fiber that was like a diamond. So it was made out of carbon, and then that way the, the satellite was attached to the planet, and. Uh, all the and the cable was in constant tension due to centrifugal force, and then you could just uh, attach a, an elevator capsule to it to go up and down. That was a science fiction book twenty or thirty years ago. And the uh, now what they're talking about for a cable is making the cable out of not diamonds, but uh, nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. And yeah. the only problem they have doing that is right now, they can only make nanotubes uh, that are uh, an inch or less in length. And it's, uh, they don't know quite how to put them all together to make them 636 miles. <laughs> yeah. What is the gravity there, Richard? 
no idea. I haven't. Compared to the Earth, because if it's not not as strong as Earth, it would be easier to move an elevator. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It, that's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I also wonder about what you have for your elevator motor. <clears throat> I guess there on that kind of elevator, the cable is stable and there's some kind of uh, wheel on the elevator that goes up and down on the cable. There's probably a reusable rocket engine or something attached to the elevator that pushes it up. <laughs> well, uh, I think you would need to take a book with you for the elevator <laughs> ride. Yeah. Maybe Warren T. Why, so, why, but, so what, why is it that they can't just uh, work right on this planet rather than go on, the, on, on a satellite off, off this planet. Why not use the planet? Uh, I don't know. Well, there's a good answer. Uh, he, he, may have, he may have thought of that, but I don't know. Uh, probably one of the things they have said, part of the problem with building these uh, habitats and other places is how do you protect against the radiation and I believe he was building the shells uh, and would build them uh, thick enough to be able then to dampen the radiation because the radiation causes a lot of damage to human bodies uh, among which are things like cancer and stuff like that, which we don't like much. <laughs> so Richard, if we move on to, I'm not sure how this is happening. Uh, we, we can get carbon dioxide out of the air. Can we do it? Well, this is the uh, hopeful side of the story on the environment and uh, there it turns out there are two companies now that are uh, making equipment that are called direct air capture or DAC. Somebody speaker is on. Could you try muting your speaker and see if that would eliminate the echo? Anyway, and then uh, unmute yourself when you want to talk. Because that's where the echo is from. Anyway, I don't hear it now. Thank you. Uh, there are two companies. There's a Swiss company, Climeworks, that already in Europe has 15 direct air capture machines around Europe, and it's the first world's first commercial DAC system. And there's a Canadian company, Carbon Engineering, that also has uh, things that are installed in the world. They use different uh, techniques to be able to capture the carbon. Uh, the European uh, draws it into a collector and then a uh, selective filter captures the CO2 and once the filter is full then basically they bury it or something like that to take the put the CO2 away. The Canadian company does it with uh, passing the air over a potassium hydro hydroxide solution which chemically removes the CO2 from the air and so both of these guys are companies, enterprises that are presently going and uh, they say that if the planet uh, made the kind of investment that they made in the Second World War, you know, a massive kind of investment that in uh, 10 years, they could uh, capture enough carbon to really start to change the uh, carbon atmosphere 
uh, problem and start to make the change that the planet needs to be able to survive. So here they're saying we have the equipment that can do it. And what we need to do is spend a lot of money at our company to uh, install all this stuff. And this direct air caption, DAC technology is still basically in its infancy. It's presently expensive. It's expected to become a lot cheaper as you scale up and use the technology more. And I know that uh, there are a number of new DAC see methods that are being developed that could uh, further contribute to this. So they're saying already <laughs> they have direct air capture uh, done significantly enough that uh, they could start to cure the problem with the environment and do it uh, within the time frame that we need to do it. Also, uh, by the way, does anybody have friends or relatives in Australia? They're saying Australia could, is poised where it could become the world leader in direct air capture because it has large amounts of land that are not suitable for growing crops. It has ample sunlight that you can use to generate the energy that the direct air capture stuff uses. And it has a lot of places where you could sequester the carbon and store it underground. So uh, maybe Australia will become an environmental leader in uh, the next decade. So anyway, there is hope. This is the case where they there is the technology. They've developed the technology. It's in production and it's starting to be uh, used in places. And we just have to do more of it to uh, save our pretty little planet. Well, you know, the, they've already uh, tried carbon capture uh, systems on the back end of power plants where the CO2 right. is much more concentrated. And they have not been able to build economic uh, facilities to do that. They, they can do it technically, but they can't do it economically. So right. how these guys can do it getting CO2 at 400 ppm instead of at 50% or whatever it is coming out of a power plant is uh, defies explanation. And it, it, I think it's probably just, uh, you know, a laboratory uh, curiosity that they're uh, trying the to The Swiss promote. company has 15 installations in Europe already. So it's not a laboratory process. It's stuff that is already going and uh, installed and in use. But why would they do it out in the middle of uh, I don't know. the loop 400? I don't know. PPM Maybe that's what they have to work on. with. Maybe that's what they have to work yeah. with. And if you could do it that way and solve the problem, then uh, you don't need the more specialized thing up the stack of the uh, polluting uh, manufacturing plant. And the thing you have up the stack of the polluting plant doesn't do anything for the carbon in the atmosphere from transportation or construction. I have a friend in Western uh, Australia, and most of that is desert. Only a little part of the southern part is uh, is green, so there's plenty of room there. I wonder how many trees you have to plant to get the same results. <laughs> Well, uh, a lot of them, uh, they've said uh, a trillion trees is what we talk about and to plant the trillion trees, all we need to do is change the way we uh, do agriculture and uh, grow animals around the planet. So it turns out that's not a simple change. Now, if we move on from that, to uh, 
uh, wood, can that lab-grown wood ease the environmental toll? Well, it, a lot of the problem in the environment is still from the way that we do agriculture and the way we do wood particularly. And uh, what they, uh, scientists are looking at very seriously now is uh, can we with plant tissue do kind of the same thing that we're doing with cultured meat. Uh, it takes a lot of wood to make a table, a wooden table. You know, first you have to grow a tree and then you have to cut it down and then you have to transport it. Then you have to mill it. Then you uh, get it to your carpenter and uh, with wood and glue and stuff, he makes a table that takes uh, about a decade or longer to happen. And there's a lot of waste in that process. And so uh, what they have found is that uh, they can take cells from plants and uh, use this as a chance to bypass all of that inefficiency. Somebody's speaker is on again, I hear the echo. And uh, you can do it uh, a lot more efficiently. And you know, when you're growing plants in nature, only a fraction of the harvested plant is actually used to make uh, the materials for production. And so, uh, the leader of this project wanted to find a way to make a more efficient way to use land and resources. And so they uh, used cells from a zinnia plant and extracting cells from its leaves so they didn't kill the zinnia. And then they took those cells and cultured them in a growth medium and then transferred those cells into a gel. And here they did a process. It turns out plant cells at this stage are similar to stem cells in that they're uncommitted and they can become anything that uh, they are induced to. And so they induce these cells to grow a rigid wood-like structure with uh, lignin in it, which is the organic polymer that gives wood its strength. And they could uh, fiddle with the process and change how much lignin it is in because you're making it in a control process. And they can then now make material that can be optimized for its particular use. And uh, their use of this gel, the gel acts as a scaffold to cause their uh, cell grown wood to grow in a particular shape. And so here, one of the ideas is you make the gel in the shape of a table, and then you just uh, grow yourself the table directly. Uh, no two by fours or wood glue is necessary. And so uh, they're doing it in the lab. They, their question is, can we scale it up? And the answer is gonna be, yes, we can scale it up. And when they scale it up, it's gonna turn out this way of generating wood is uh, uses fewer resources and is faster than anything in nature. And it looks like a uh, new way to do it. And this is a radical yet elegant solution and will create a new paradigm, they believe. So wanna grow a table?
Yeah. I wouldn't mind the grown table, so long as it was as cheap, cheaper than a wooden one. I mean, if you're going to paint it a certain colour, it doesn't really matter what's underneath the coat of paint. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We're still getting some noise from somebody's microphone. And there was one little error error in that article. I yes. think because they talked about lignin being the structural component, but really it's cellulose that's the structural component and lignin is the glue that holds the cellulose fibers to one another and provides the structure. Okay. But that's secondary. They're still trying to grow structural materials, so. Right. And to me, it's uh -huh. exciting uh, to see the stuff that they're trying to do and uh, to extend the idea past the cell-grown meat into what else can we grow with that process, I think is uh, kind of wonderful thinking. And Richard, if we move along a bit, what's your deep relationship to your inner voice? What's that about? Well, uh, this may be a problem. It's the voice in the head. And uh, Ethan Chris, who's an American experimental psychologist and neuroscientist, uh, says that, uh, you know, the person doesn't who doesn't sometimes find themselves listening to an unhelpful voice in their head probably doesn't exist. And uh, this guy has spent his career uh, studying the noise that is in all of our heads. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, this can be a problem. There's lots of uh, data that says uh, stress leads to illness and that uh, the things that we say to ourselves are one of the major contributors to stress, certainly for some people. And, you know, this mental voice is a problem. One of the things they found out in studying it is the middle voice they say uh, is at a rate equivalent to 4,000 words a minute. Most of us speak a uh, uh, hundred words a minute is a typical uh, speed. So, you know, those long state of the union messages that the politicians give, Typically, uh, they're like an hour and 6,000 words, and we're speaking to ourselves uh, that much almost every minute. And so this noise can be paralyzing, and that uh, there's a lot of data that shows that the inner experience dwarfs the outer experience in terms of effects on people's behavior. And so this particular guy, the reason for this article is that he wrote a book and in his book, he talks about a toolbox of techniques that we can use to kind of dial down this mental chatter and, you know, he said, this is important because, you know, if you just talk about it, venting it to a friend, for example, often does a person more harm than good because this kind of venting drives away your friends. And so uh, it doesn't help you in the long term. And so 
there are things that you can do yourself, he says, that have been proven to do you some good. And when he say proven, he's speaking of it from the standpoint of a neuroscientist who is studying the brains of people who are doing this. And so one of the things he found that is a uh, uh, fast and straightforward way is to change your dialogue to yourself, to talk to yourself in like you were another person altogether, uh, saying, you know, Richard doesn't need to do this or something. And this way you uh, put the thoughts at a distance and it's like you become the observer of the thoughts and not so involved in it. Then there are other techniques that certainly our people know that help deal with this stuff. One is hugging a friend. They better be a friend if you're hugging them. Another is hugging a tree, getting out in nature. Another is uh, things that bring about a sense of awe, which can be, again, nature or uh, an art museum. Writing a daily journal helps some people. And uh, another thing that helps here is tidying up. It turns out if you clean up your space, you clean up your life. And when asked, what can you do? What can you suggest now for people in this time of COVID? Uh, what should we action should we deploy during the pandemic? Uh, what he recommends is a thing that is known as temporal distancing. And so here, if you ask a person, uh, what are you going to think about this and feel about it in 10 years, then uh, if people start to put their troubles in perspective and their anxiety and tension can go down. So he says there are simple things that we can do with ourselves and do to with each other to lower the pressure of all of this stuff that we tell ourselves. You know, and part of the problem with the stuff we tell ourselves is this, these are things where some people just get in a vicious cycle where it goes down and down and down. And you can break that cycle with some of these easy techniques and by his book, of course. Yeah. Any comments? It, it sounds to me like it kind of, you just need to be logical and no. take the emotion out of making decisions. I don't think he's saying that. I think he's just saying you need to somehow kind of distance yourself from, from it and lessen your identification with it. Does he uh, mention uh, petting a dog or a cat or something? Because that's supposed to be very therapeutic. Oh, sure. <laughs> if you're hugging, I guess you don't have to hug a person. <laughs> So Richard, if we want to move on from uh, what you do with your inner voice to how you can hear better other voices, what's this new device that's on there? Okay, now I was interested in this. I've had a uh, hearing loss that I trust try to deal with with hearing aids and the hearing aids are not satisfactory in a lot of situations. Uh, they can amplify one voice fine, but if it's one voice within a number of voices, then uh, you can't pick out the voice you're trying to listen to. And 
this is the first product that is using AI to try to make a difference. And uh, what you what they have demonstrated is a device that is connected to a pair of uh, a set of Bluetooth headphones. And this device you wear around your neck, it's about the size of a pin. And this is the OrCam here. And it works by uh, isolating somebody's voice from a crowd and then beaming their speech to ViewTube. And it uses basically lip reading and body gestures to figure out which voice you're actually uh, trying to hear and then uh, identifies based on like the rhythm of the uh, mouth, which voice that you're listening to and then amplifies that and uh, you can hear. Uh, this product is not on the market yet. It's expected to get to the market this year. It'll work with uh, wireless devices, Bluetooth devices, and uh, they don't know the price of it, but it may be the kind of product that the, is, uh, becomes really important for the people who are hearing impaired, which is a lot of us. Any thoughts? Yeah. I had a friend and um, his wife used to insist that he sit at the table and eat his dinner and not watch the hockey game. And he learned how to tune his hearing aid in so he could listen to the commentary. <laughs> so he had a Bluetooth <laughs> hearing aid and he used it, he tuned it into the hockey game. Yeah. Yeah, that my wife is just shouting. She's saying, "Yeah, it was a Bluetooth thing." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess then, Richard, we'll sign off. Thank you so much again, and thanks to everybody for participating. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>